the letters of the New Testament to individuals and to churches were written because God wants us to live holy lives. That is, to be faithful to Him in His Son's church. We emphasized at that time from a study of at least a, I guess you would say survey, of chapter 2 mainly of <coughs> Ephesians, that everything is wrought in Christ regarding our salvation. As to what all that means in the world to come, I have no idea. All I know is, is that what's going on now regarding mankind and his salvation, his faithful service to God, and how all of that's done through Christ to the glory of God the Father, is going to have to do with what we are in a glorified state in the ages to come. As I said this morning, I want to be in a glorified state with my Christ when this life is over and the world is ended and the resurrection has come. I cannot fathom a person who wears the name Christian not desiring that to be or thinking that all he should ever have in the way of a blessing is a material blessing in this world. Our expectation is not in this world ultimately. It is eternal glory in heaven. I can only generally describe it as that. There are various other passages in both the Old but especially the New Testament that lets us know the radical changes that are beyond our present finite human minds to grasp in the ages to come when material things and time and space exist no more. So tonight, or this afternoon, I would like to zero in a little bit more on this business of what it is to be a new creature in Christ. <coughs> Paul wrote to the church at Philippi, and I say in passing, he was very close to that church because of how they lived and what they had done for him as he labored to preach the gospel. And he plainly pointed out, and this really is where we're settling in on in this study, let this mind be in you. That is the mind of Christ. God doesn't ask us to do something we can't do. And I want us to look at chapter 2, 5 through 11 of Philippians. Chapter 2, 5 through 11. And our title of this lesson comes from verse 5, where you have Paul saying to the church in Philippi, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. The force of the little three-letter word let is one of those words of saying, you ought to do this. It's part of what you are as a Christian. It is the Lord's will that you do this. But being that you are a free moral agent, you have to will it to happen. And you have to follow the way that it happens. It's not something that's going to be done by Harry Potter's magic wand waved over you. It's going to be done with your cooperation. You're doing what is necessary in mind and body to bring it about. Nevertheless, this is the way it ought to be. What should characterize every member of the church and will for those who are going to be in heaven is that we will strive with all of our ability to have the mind of Christ in us. God said we could do it. God said we ought to do it. It is essential that we do it. Sometimes we speak of the essentials in the plan, God's plan of salvation. Well, here is an essential to the new creature in Christ. Here is what is a must if we would reach heaven. So in verses 1 through 4 of this chapter, Paul wrote about a unity among the brethren. And you see how this ties in with fellowship that produces joy, not as the world defines joy. That's an important point. All too often, and it's been said from this pulpit not long ago, that we tend to look for a joy 
that is as the world sees joy or a peace in the way that the world sees pre peace. I, I stand amazed just being a student of history to still hear people say that uh, play for peace in the world. No more wars. No more fighting. Um, listen to me. It ain't going to happen. <laughs> now I use that bold word ain't <laughs> to make an emphasis. That's not going to happen in this world. And that's not the peace the Lord's talking about that members of his kingdom who are faithful to his word possesses. The joy that he talks about and the unity that children of God ought to have is not a joy like you see displayed and only displayed when you have the victory over Europe in World War II or over Japan. Yeah, we should rejoice about that. We're not saying that at all. But the ultimate peace and joy of the faithful child of God who has the mind of Christ is that when you're in misery, when you're being persecuted for righteousness sake, when you're in dire circumstances, that joy that Christ offers and that peace that he gives is never taken away. In fact, those may be the things that enhance it and make it even stronger. There are times that we face situations in our lives on earth due to moral, mortal deficiencies, that is, physical problems. And they may not be going to get better. They may get worse. And there's one thing for sure. It's appointed unto man once to die. And after that, the judgment. So whatever modern medicine can do and whatever a good uh, outlook on life can produce and a good positive attitude, you can have that. And I'm all for it if it's taught by the Bible. But you're still going to die. And you're going to die because this mortal body is going to biologically cease to function. And that's going to be caused by something. It may be some car hitting you. Maybe some kind of disease. Whatever it may be, this body's going to quit someday. Now to me, to have the hope of heaven that never ends. To have the expectation of glory as Christ possesses it now where there's no possibility of death, the consequences of death, and no sin, where there's no sickness, where everything's done to perfection as God is the perfect one. That's the goal for me. It's not going to happen in this life. The closest you're going to come to it is where a congregation of God's people are doing what Paul said, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ. Now, I want to emphasize that having this kind of peace and joy that Paul's going to talk about in these verses 5 through 11, that he's going to give us the motivation, the motivation for having this joy, this peace, this unity, this fellowship that's from above. He's going to give us the very nature of this oneness, of this fellowship, and he's going, as we've already mentioned, to give us the state of mind, the attitude that we should have, but is absolutely necessary to possess this joy, peace, unity, and fellowship. Now, in describing these things, the apostle called upon the brethren in the church at Philippi to do nothing through selfish ambition or conceit. There's been all kinds of problems in churches that had nothing to do with what we would normally say, quote, doctrinal matters. Oh, there's been enough of those. But a lot of them have been caused because people have done things through selfish ambition or conceit. Do we strive to look to see in our minds if there's any selfish ambition or conceit? Paul says that we must have lowliness of mind in such a state that we esteem others better than ourselves.
I simply call to record Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in our Lord's own life on earth to show you the perfect example of that. There's also the disposition, if you're faithful, that looks out for the interests of others and not only one's own personal interests. You know, all three of these are lacking in our world today, period. These things really, regarding moral matters and how people just get along with one another, not thinking about forgiveness of sins and serving God faithfully in the church, ought to be being taught by mom and daddy at home and exemplified by them. You don't see a lot today of people being concerned about other folks. A lot that's being said today in this nation about somebody's rights not being granted to them. If you look at some of that kind of thing, what they're crusading for you know, is their own rights to be done and run over anybody <laughs> else's rights to get what they want. And that's rather an amazing thing. But we who are enlightened by the gospel of Christ, we who spend our times meditating day and night on the truth of God, who've learned to write and divide it and are interested in spiritual matters, above all, we should show this and exemplify it to the world. In verse 5, we see then that Paul continues to exhort them to have this mind. And that's the attitudes he's going to talk about in verses 3 and 4. Because he says, now this is the mind of Christ. You are a member of his spiritual body. Remember our study this morning of Ephesians 2? When you were baptized into Christ, your alien sins that originally separated you from God were all washed away by the blood of the Lamb when you were buried with him in baptism. You're raised to walk a new life, a new creature in Christ. You have the blessings of being in the family of the living God. And you have the great wonderful expectation of knowing that as you pursue living the Christian life, the blood of Christ cleanses you from your sins. 1 John 1 and verse 7. That's not said to just anybody in the church. That's said to the one who is striving to let this mind be in you. You're not going to be flawless. How could you grow if you were already grown? So it's obvious then something's got to make up the difference in the frailties of mankind, though they have from the heart obeyed that form of doctrine. And it has to be that the blood we contact in the water of baptism continues to flow over us as we walk in the light as he is in the light. Wouldn't that be letting the mind of Christ dwell in you? And it cleanses us from all sins. So we need to understand that we need this mind of Christ to be the things we ought to be in the church. In the verses 6 through 11, the apostle is elaborating on the mind of Christ or the attitude of Christ. And I want us to focus on what the apostle is teaching all members of the church about the mind of Christ in these verses. When you look at verse 6, who being in the form of God, that is Christ, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, this, of course, is before his incarnation. When John would write about in John 1, uh, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, the same was in the beginning with God, and without him was not anything made. Then in verse 14, he tells us that word, is Jesus Christ incarnate. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, glory as of the only begotten of the Father. So Jesus, prior to His incarnation, was in the form of deity. That's how I know that deity has a form. may not be a form like ours. In fact, I'm sure it's not physically, because He's not physical or He's not material. But deity has a form. And... Whatever that form is, it means that he couldn't be tempted to sin because James tell us that, tells us that he is not tempted to break his own laws and he doesn't tempt anybody else or solicit them to violate his laws. Now, he existed, and this is what's being said, and Vine talks about it in this way, and 
or, or Vincent, I believe it is, in his word studies, that Christ existed as essentially one with God because he was God, the one divine essence, the one deity. This is in accord with then what I said in John 1, verses 1 through 3. He was equal with God because he was God. In the Jews' mind, when you said that you were the son of somebody, you made yourself equal with him. That's the reason when you go back and read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and you see the Pharisees and chief priests, the scribes all uh, throwing a wall-eyed fit. Do you pitch a fit or throw a fit? Anyway, they may have done both and uh, probably did when he said he was the son of God because they knew in their understanding that made him equal with God. But we notice that he certainly shared this glory with the Father, John 17, 5. And it's something we learn from the Old Testament in Isaiah chapter 50, uh, 42 and verse 8 that God has made it clear he doesn't share that with anybody. So he is God. He's the second person of the Godhead who became flesh, who became you and me in the sense of humanity. Yet Christ didn't consider such an equality, the King James says, robbery, uh, literally a thing to be grasped. That is something to be laid hold of, something to be retained jealously. That's what has always amazed me and continues. I continue to grow in amazement. We talk about his suffering and death on the cross and how horrible that is. But just think about it. Christ was the executor who made this world flawless and watched man corrupt it. And yet he came into his own creation. And in just coming into this creation, into this sinful world, he placed himself in a position, as are all men, to be approached by Satan. In the form of God, he couldn't be tempted with evil. But when he took upon himself the form of man, then he could be approached by Satan, and certainly Satan did, and brought about his death through the hands of wicked men. So we need to understand that Christ didn't say, well, I just, let me think about this overnight. No, it was the Father's will. If it's the Father's will, he's deity and I'm deity. This is essential and I'll do it. Now, once he gets down here as a man, he struggles as a man. You see that in the Garden of Gethsemane. Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. But as a man, he overcame every temptation to sin. As a man, he brought himself in subjection to the Father's will flawlessly in thought, word, and action. Now, does that help you understand what Paul is saying? Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. So a, two, a true demonstration of a lack of selfish ambition and conceit is seen in Jesus Christ in the flesh doing what's necessary that we couldn't do to save us from our own sins. We should exemplify that as members of the body of Christ and Christians and individuals in particular. So the question for us is, is it, do we have the mind of Christ? Do we consider our standing, and we'll put that in quotes, before others, uh, whatever it may be, something to which we must tenaciously hold on to? Why, if I did that, I would be the laughing stock of the world. Or if I did that, that would embarrass me before people and so forth. Well, if complying with God's will is going to embarrass anybody, then I'll just have to be embarrassed. But you don't see that in the child of God submitting to the Lord's will. They don't consider it that way, letting the mind of Christ be in them and guide their thoughts, words, and actions. Why? Why? Because they know it is putting into practice that which God wants us to do. So do we consider ourselves more important than others? Uh, do we consider the distinction so, uh, something to be, shall we say, preserved at all cost? Well, if that's what's guiding us, then we lack the mind of Christ. As we continue to read on in our text, we also see that the mind of Christ looked out 
for the interests of others. Look at verses 7 and 8. But made himself of no reputation. You notice how most of us spend our lives trying to make a reputation? I want you to think about that for a minute. All our lives we're trying to do something that says, to one extent or the other, look at me and what I've accomplished. Or look at my son or daughter and what they've accomplished. Let me tell you, and we've got all these pictures that nobody wants to see. Or we've got all these tales that our kids have done. Or, or my father was this. Or my mother was that. Or I've got a brother that's so-and-so. And we spend so much time with this business of the world's perspective of a reputation to the point so many times we're not obedient to God. When Christ became flesh, he made himself of no reputation. Notice the scripture uses the terms, he emptied himself. He divested himself of the glory he had with the Father, John 17, 5, when he was still in the form of deity, when he could not be tempted with evil, when he didn't have to suffer a thing we do as sinful mankind. He took upon himself, he willingly took upon himself the form of a servant, that is, become a human. He did not come to earth as a wealthy and powerful king a uh, nobleman, a ruler of some sort. You know, that was a big stumbling block for Jews because their concept of the Messiah was he would be another kind of combination of Solomon and David, great warrior king that's very powerful and wise in the ways of this world. But that wasn't the case. Being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, verse 8, and became obedient unto death. And it wasn't just somebody whacking his head off one clean cut, clean cut with a headsman sword. That's the reason he says even the death of the cross. It was the most heinous type of death that one can undergo. And yet that's how low our Lord was willing to stoop. Guess what? The only reason to save me and to save you because we couldn't do it ourselves. So he was the lowly son of a carpenter and all that that meant. He came in the likeness of men. And as such, he could experience their temptations and sufferings, and disappointments, and letdowns, all kinds of whatever, the peaks and valleys of life. Can you think in your life right now of how at times you're just in a state of exult exultation and yet not long thereafter you're down at the bottom of the pits of, of despair? That's the way life is without the mind of Christ. But if you want to see something level out your life, then just have the mind of Christ because your interest becomes one thing. Let me do God's will. And that's all that matters. Now, that is a continual effort. There are times because we're in the flesh that those things, we slip sometimes, let's put it that way, and uh, we fall back on things, and we have to rebuke ourselves. And we have to pray to God for forgiveness, for strength not to have those attitudes anymore. But if you have the mind of Christ, you won't quit doing that. So it's... Uh, in other words, though he was deity, he was also as much man as he was deity. He wasn't um, a superman, but he was a human being. And I like to just think of Christ in his human state. Just think of yourself. And think of all the things that you fight and your ups and your downs and your rounds and about and good and bad and miserable, whether it's with you personally or you're in your family or whatever, just remember he went through all of that and was subject to every bit of it as far as having to deal with matters on this earth. Yet he was obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. That's why that our faith, if it's lively enough and strong enough, will always lead us to obey Christ and he won't bless us until our faith 
will take him at his word to the point of obeying his will. But God be thanked that you were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you, being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. Or Hebrews 5 and verse 8, that was Romans 6, 17 and 18, where he makes it very clear that though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. Though in every way then a human like each of us, while still the Son of God, he humbled himself and obediently suffered, even to undergoing such a terrible, excruciating, shameful death as that of crucifixion. Well, I ask you again, when you read what Paul wrote to these Christians, our brethren of 2,000 years ago almost, in the city of Philippi, and thus he wrote to all of us who loved and obeyed the Lord and are members of the church, why did he do all of this? Why do I need to have these words written down to remind me of what he did? Remember, these folks had heard the gospel before this letter ever came to them. They had humbly believed it and obeyed it. They, had to live, they were living the Christian life. They were already great in Paul's eyes and faithful service to God and standing by him and the great work he was doing. Why did they need to hear this? So they would keep on keeping on. He did it for the sake of others. Because they couldn't help themselves. You, want, you know one of the most heinous crimes, one of the most vile and wicked crimes that's going on right now in America is the murdering of the unborn child. Those poor babies have nobody to protect them. And where they should be in the most secure place, their own mother's womb, there's as great a danger as they would be if they were left on a street corner, if not more. And we have an element in this country that is glorifying the fact that they can now feel free by the law of the land to put those babies to death and have no pricking of the conscience. Folks, that's as, as dangerous as it gets. And there is a God in heaven who sees it all and will not sit there indefinitely letting it go on. I go on a lot longer than we understand, but I don't know what God knows. I don't see what God sees. And I don't know what He's got planned. All I know is when we get to the point to where we will not help others who cannot help themselves, the mind of Christ is so far from us. He became a human. He humbled Himself as a man. He was obedient and then died on the cross because it was for our own good, for our interest. Now, let me pause here and say, removing from moral sins like abortion, what about those of us in the spiritual body of Christ regarding spiritual dereliction among our own brethren? We can get very upset, and we ought to, and not enough people are, regarding abortion. But sometimes in the spiritual body of Christ, members of the church can do things that are sinful and are going to condemn their souls to hell. But what do we do who are faithful toward them? Have we not, if we don't watch out, adopted another calloused heart toward the aborted church member who by his own poor choices has forsaken the mind of Christ and chosen to become overtaken in the trespass when we have the obligation to you which are spiritual restore such in one in the spirit of meekness considering thyself lest thou also be tempted Christ did all of this to bear our reproach Romans 15 1 through 3 and Isaiah great chapter <coughs> 53, 4 through 6. <clears throat> he was looking out for the interest of all humans, no matter what it cost him. And we should have the same view, one toward another, especially in the church. Think about what Paul said to the Galatians when we're to do good to all men. Now watch it. Especially they of the household of faith. Do we have the mind of Christ? <clears throat> we do if we're looking out for the interest of others. But I'll say this quickly. As the Bible defines that interest and as God controls us, 
to deal with it. That's always a need to put on any particular thing is what does the Bible define it to be? How does the Bible say it should be done? In other words, if I'm to care for you and you're to care for me as members of the church, I've got to go to the mind of Christ to learn how to do that. Sometimes, though, we disagree with the mind of Christ when we should be in submission to it. We've got to humble ourselves. We must even sacrifice ourselves if it's in the best interest of others. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 16. Such is the mind of Christ. It's one of humility. It's one of service to others as the Bible defines that service and as it teaches it to us in detail. But nevertheless, it is service to others. Now notice verses 9 through 11. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of, Lord, of God the Father. You can do it now and call on his name of his Son in obedience to the gospel and be saved. Or you can wait in rebellion to the gospel to the last day and you can do it then and it won't do you any good. When I see Governor Cuomo and others like him signing bills like they signed concerning immoralities that they laugh about and enjoy, I know there's a day coming when all such people are going to bow the knee to Christ and acknowledge him for what he is. But it's too late at the end of time. For any good that Christ could do for us, the only one who can do it, that we read of in the scriptures. So he, Christ, is the good example of which there's no greater of, as far as the scriptural maximum, maxim that he humbled himself shall be exalted. God's highly exalted Jesus in at least two ways. In the present by giving him a name that is above every name. That's the name by which men are saved. There is no other name given among men on this earth whereby we must be saved. Acts 4.12 And then the future is spoken of here. That in his name every knee should bow. That every tongue should confess that he is Lord. <clears throat> we haven't got time. We won't do it now. But jot down Revelation 5. Verses 11 through 14 with that point in mind. But now in our case, members of the church, remember what we talked about this morning, members of the body of Christ, new creatures in Christ, those who possess the mind of Christ will participate in that marvelous and great future exaltation of Christ. This is the burden that Paul is writing about, at least one of them, in Romans 8, 16 through 18, especially as he writes about the coming of Christ and judgment on the wicked men who persecute the church and tells us what it will be like for the faithful on that day in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 10 through 12. What a wonderful, what an amazing motivator, a marvelous motivator for each Christian to have, to keep, and to cultivate is this mind of Christ and ourselves and how it will be borne out in the fruit of our lives. So we've seen then in this passage from Philippians 2 that the mind of Christ always involves humility on our part. It did in Christ. It does in us. Obedience on our part. It did in Christ. It does for us. Sacrifice on our part, it did for Christ, it does for us. And great, great reward that Christ now has and promises us if we're faithful unto death. So do we possess the mind of Christ? We should, we ought to, we must if heaven is to be our home. It is the key to the unity or the fellowship of brethren that produces a joy unspeakable. It ends up in one day forever sharing the glory with Christ himself. As Christians, then we need to make it our diligent business to manifest the mind of Christ in our relationship to God, 
before the world and to each other. Let this mind be in you. After this study, hopefully, we understand better what Paul meant when he wrote the following to the church in the city of Rome. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Romans 12, 1 and 2. Now, if you're not a Christian, one who is of Christ, like you read of in your own New Testament, why... Do you want to remain in that condemned, lost state? Why not be honest and bold and courageous and show your love for God and godly things to one who did nothing but save you and do for you in doing so what you couldn't do for yourself? He's authored the great plan of salvation. You can be reconciled to Him when from the heart you obey the gospel and believing that Christ is the Son of God, repenting of your sins, confessing your faith in Him, and being baptized into Christ for the remission of sins. When you do that, then you can spend what time you have remaining diligently and zealously following the truth of the gospel as a new creature with the expectation of glory unspeakable when time is no more. What is your situation? Think about these things. Obey the truth. Make it as sure as you can. And you can do that if you'll come to Christ while we stand and sing.